The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon Lord be with you. And with Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, who hast given thine only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification, grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve the impureness of living through the merits of the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The first epistle is 
taken from St. John chapter 5 from verse 4. Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Here endeth the lesson. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory, Glory be to thee, O Lord. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you, as the Father hath sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee. Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, a light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. 
who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank you for being here with us today. Um, thank you for visiting with us online. Um, this is Trinity Anglican Church, and um, those of us who can come at least, uh, we reserved um, our attendance to very a very small handful, really essentially just... Uh, two or three family units um, and under 10 um, and uh, in order to uh, uh, maintain uh, some good practices here. Um, there are not too many uh, uh, announcements, of course. Our men's breakfast will be May 2nd, but we, we will likely not be having the men's breakfast. What we will be doing is either doing a conference call or a video call. Um, the, uh, uh, the other things that I would mention is, of course, um, uh, we are doing evening prayer on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursday nights, and that's being live streamed um, on our Facebook page. We're also live streaming our Wednesday morning services um, at 8.30 a.m. for morning prayer and 9 o'clock for uh, communion. Apart from that, I'd like to read uh, some remarks from our bishop, um, from the Diocese of the Northeast, Bishop Brian Marsh. Um, just a, a week and a half ago, Bishop Marsh was here to film his, um, or to record his uh, Episcopal service, and uh, because of, you know, we're uh, equipped for that. And uh, that went off very well, and uh, we're going to be doing some more of that for the bishop. The bishop has requested that he use um, uh, our church for those purposes, so I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, our bishop writes, Dear friends in Christ, how often have we heard the phrase, these are difficult times, or something very much like it, during the past several weeks? We cannot dispute the essential truth of that statement. There are, after all, difficult times. The times, wrote Shakespeare, are out of joint. The simplest actions seem to cause anxiety. We cannot visit the grocery store or the post office without feeling we may be placing ourselves at risk of illness. Most of us cover our mouths and nose with masks, and we generally avoid eye ca contact, but that is when we venture outside. Mostly we find ourselves inside in our homes. We cannot go to church and worship in the way we're most familiar, embracing our brothers and sisters, sitting next to each other in a spirit of love and harmony. That may well be the most painful part of our lives during this time. Faithful Christians anticipate joyfully the fellowship in Christ that our churches provide, Without that most important part of our lives, we may feel adrift, even a bit lost. We need to remember that God's love transcends such times of, trans of separation. God's love seeks us out in all the days of our lives, particularly during the challenging events that all lives encounter. God knows what separation is all about. Jesus has prepared us for such moments. Recently, a friend recommended a little book entitled Experiencing Jesus, Scripture, the Witness of Saints and Mystics, and a Life of Prayer Show the Way. A long title, that, but experiencing Jesus says it all. We can experience Jesus best through the words he spoke. Jesus is, of course, the Word made flesh. During his lifetime, hardly anyone recognized him as God. He was simply a carpenter and a rabbi. And yet, through the words he spoke, 
He drew all who had ears to hear to the nearness of God, to God's love. If we are to paraphrase some of the words Jesus spoke, they might well read like this. I have the words of eternal life. My words are truth. But there came a time of separation between Jesus and the disciples. It came during that first Eastertide. But we remember what Jesus told his followers during the Last Supper. I have said this to you while I am still with you. But the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, that the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. Jesus remains with us. He is available to us all through prayer. During this time of enforced isolation, we all have the gift of time, time to pray, time to be with God. Though we may, have, though we may be separated by distance, Jesus teaches us that we are always unified in his love and in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Blessed Easter tide to you all, your brother in Christ, Brian. Let's see, there are also um, uh, 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 some other comments. He says, dear friends in Christ, during this time of quarantine, the work of the diocese continues, and I wish to offer you a brief update. I would like to thank the clergy and parishes for the imaginative ways which Easter was celebrated, several parishes just, such as Trinity Rochester, Transfiguration, St. Luke, St. Nicholas, and St. Margaret's stream services through the use of Vimeo on Facebook. Some parishes use local public access TV uh, to broadcast their Easter services. The recorded services reach many people who do not normally attend our parishes. According to some estimates, several hundred watch some of our services. He goes on to give special thanks uh, to all who have served here, Father Matt, Mike McKinnon, Carlos, and his daughter Catherine, uh, for making the Easter Mass so memorable. Um, and uh, he continues that uh, East Episcopal visits have been postponed at present, but uh, more will be forthcoming on that. Anyway, that's enough of that. So um, now... Oh, you will also notice that, that the offering basket, since we're not going to be taking a formal offering, is in the back there for when you leave, for example. All right. So here we have our reading for today from John. Chapter 20. from verse 19. And it reads, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the, dis the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia, alleluia. This is the report from Mary and the other women to the disciples. Jesus is risen from the dead. We have seen the Lord. Later that evening, the first day of the week, most of the disciples, most, are gathered in an upper room, shut in behind closed doors. Most, but not all. Someone is missing. The doors are definitively shut, barred for fear of the Jews. Imagine their apprehension. Since the start of Jesus' ministry, the Jews had promised that anyone who believed that he was the Messiah or should say anything in those terms would be put out of the synagogue. That was the stigma that no observant Jew would have wanted to bear. No doubt, I suspect the disciples had already experienced that. They had already borne it. Others like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea kept their faith hidden because of those fears. So there was a context of fear underlying things for some time. Now those fears have been completely realized. They witnessed their master having been taken away in the dead of night by temple soldiers and then crucified like a criminal. In their minds at any moment, 
the soldiers could be looking for them too. The fear is understandable given the situation. And then suddenly and inexplicably, behind the closed doors, Jesus is present. We don't know how he's present. We know that he hasn't passed through the doors. They haven't unlocked the doors. Nobody has knocked on the door. Jesus comes and he stands there before them, and they are, are aghast at the sight, I'm sure, not knowing what to believe. We have to remember that then, as many people do now, people did believe in ghosts and apparitions, so they didn't know what to think. It's as if, when, if you recall, when Jesus was walking on the water and he came up alongside the boat, and they thought it was an apparition, they thought it was a ghost, and they were frightened. And so Jesus comes and stands in their midst, and they are fearful. And so he says, peace be with you. And then shows them his nail-pierced hands and his side. It's important to remember that he did not appear before them in a body beaten and bloody, stumbling back from the dead like a superhero in a movie. But he appears before them clean and resplendent, every lash and every wound having been healed except for his hands and his side, signatures of the resurrection. It's not merely that he passed through the locked doors, but he also passed through their fear, passed through the fear that held them. We have to take that fear seriously. It would be easy to bypass, as Jesus did, the doors. To walk past it and immediately present the nailed, scarred hands. We have to take the fear that they were experiencing seriously. They're not huddled behind the closed doors because they're simply waiting for Jesus. We know, we've grown up with the story, we've read it many times, we know the end of the story, Jesus is risen from the dead. And we read that and assume that into their experience when we read this narrative. They did not know that Jesus was risen from the dead. They are locked behind the door, still fearful, not knowing at all that Jesus is going to stand in their midst. All they had was the report of a few emotional women Barely the credible testimony, barely a credible testimony in the ancient world. And also perhaps that of Peter and John and their witness to the empty tomb and the, the grave cloths lying beside. That's all they had. They really weren't expecting a resurrection. They certainly weren't expecting Jesus Christ to stand there before them in that room. No, they're huddled behind those closed doors because of real fear. They didn't know what would happen. They don't know that he's risen. What they do know is the brutality of Rome and the treacherous betrayal of the leaders of their nation in crucifying their Lord. That's what they know. They know all too well what crucifixion is. They've been seeing it for years, and they witness their Lord endure that horror. That was a horrific event. And if anything would cause fear, it would be the crucifixion. It was designed to create fear. It was designed to intimidate. It was designed to signal to everybody that if you cross the state, this is your fate. We have to take that fear seriously. When Jesus pronounces peace, to his disciples, he is allaying very real fears, a justified fear of Rome, and a justified terror of a ghostly apparition. When Jesus gives a blessing of peace, though, it is instant, convincing, powerful, and effective. When Jesus speaks, the soul at once finds peace and rest. He shows his hands and his, sides, his side because by these wounds he is now and will forever be identified. It is the wounds that identify Jesus, 
The proof of, proof of his resurrection was in the near, now pierced hands and his pierced side, not in his form. It was the wounds that proved that he was not a ghost or a mere apparition. It was the wounds that were the signature of the resurrection, not his appearance. It is the presence of the wounds that are the most compelling witness to the resurrection, that it really happened and was no figment of imagination. Many years ago, we had a little dog named Gizmo. He was a little black Pomeranian, and he was run over by a car. And somebody who was living with us at the time saw it and bared witness. Yep, both tires went over him, and he went right up in the wheel well of each wheel. And he's a very, he was a very small fella. And so he came in, and he got me, and he said, Gizmo had been run over. And we ran out there, and all I could think of was my daughter, daughter who loved that dog and uh, slept with him. He slept with her. And I went out, and I picked up the dog from the street, and the dog was in that arched position with his head back and his back arched that you find typically, you know, you typically find a dead animal in that position. And I picked him up, and his body felt strangely plump. And I put him on the grass, and I tried to s put my hand to see if there were any, uh, if there was any uh, uh, breath. I could determine no breath. There was blood from his nose. His eyes were a little bulged out of his head. He didn't look good. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, as far as I could tell, by that examination, the dog was dead. But I could only think of my daughter and how heartbroken she would be. And I took the dog away from everybody else, around into a corner of my house where nobody could see. And I began to pray. And I said, Lord, raise this dog. Now, this sounds like a fantastical story, but there are witnesses. And my eldest son came, and he began to pray with me. And we said, in the name of Jesus, get up. And all of a sudden, that dog looked at us, and then he started to turn his head. And then before long, as we continued to pray, he began to scramble up and pull himself up by his front legs. And my son said, as we were praying, Dad, he's going to be fine. I felt like God has told me he's just going to have a broken leg. We ended up taking the dog to the vet. And the vet said, your dog's fine. He's just got a broken leg. So they pinned the leg. Now, the interesting thing is, in a story like that, well, of course, there are a lot of things that we could think. Maybe he wasn't really dead, maybe this, maybe that. Whatever, you're free to believe what you want. Um, but the strange thing is that if God healed him, why not heal the broken leg? Why not heal the broken leg? God left the wound as a signature that it really happened. This is real. Jesus' wounds in his hand and his side are the signature that this was not an apparition. They didn't just have a vision of Jesus. They weren't having uh, a mass delusion. The disciples huddled in fear, and they thought they saw Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus. They were so convinced that Jesus should be raised from the dead that they had a, a joint delusion. Why would you even imagine that Jesus would be raised and still have the scars in his hands and the, 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 the piercing in his side? Why would you even tell a story that your God is dead and buried and raised again and still comes out with a wound? It doesn't make sense. No. The wounds are the signature that the resurrection was real, that what they observed truly happened, that what was standing before them was truly the one who was crucified. Those wounds are what identified Jesus and verified who he was. The peace that he offers to the disciples is predicated on his nail-scarred hands and pierced side. When Jesus says peace, it is not an empty peace 
It is not the peace of a God who sits removed from human suffering in heaven, far above it all, but a peace by one who has risked hell and death. It is a peace pronounced by the one who has been pierced with the spear of terror, of pain, and of anguish. It is a peace that flows from his side in a stream of blood and water, forever baptizing the world in a bath of grace and forgiveness. If we ever wanted evidence that God loves the world, that God loves you, that God loves me, and has pity on us in our suffering and pain, in our despair, in our fear, it is that he gives his nail-scarred hands and pierced side as proofs. It's not only that he endures bodily suffering, but that he has also walked the gauntlet, gauntlet of fear and despair. He did not hold himself back from fear, but swallowed it and transmuted it, drinking it, that elixir of death, and transmuting it into eternal life for all of us. Just as Jesus entered the room where they were huddled in fear, he entered, enters into our enclosed spaces, our fears, our apprehensions, our doubts. The resurrection makes it possible for Jesus to instantly enter our fearful and troubled spaces, our homes, our families, our hearts, and put them at ease. He comes in and stands in that space and says, peace be with you. What more important thing could we hear in these days when we are shut up in our own homes? The resurrection makes it possible for Jesus to instantly enter into those spaces. But we have one thing to, one question to ask. Where was Thomas? And why was he not there with the other disciples when he appeared on the first day of the week when he was risen from the dead? Clearly, this is evidence that none of them expected Jesus to be there, and certainly not him. We can only surmise that Thomas was too fearful to leave his home. Wherever the disciples ran off to on the night that Jesus was betrayed and that they came in to take him in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, Thomas hid himself under a rock. Once he learned that Jesus was crucified, and we have no evidence that he looked on with Peter or John or Mary, um, and Mary the mother of Jesus, he must have gone into hiding. He must have locked himself into his own house, his own home. In fact, it seems that he hadn't even learned about the report that Jesus has risen from the dead until after this event. On the first day of the week when the disciples were shut in behind locked doors for the fear of the Jews, Thomas was hiding alone. If Thomas was called the twin, that's what it says, Didymus, Thomas, the twin, and we call him the doubter, we might also call him the fearful. He may have looked like someone else. He may have been called the twin because of his Aramaic name. He may have been called a doubter because he didn't believe their report. But the fact is, his doubt was born as much from fear as skepticism. One wonders how closely these things are related, or indeed, if doubt and fear are twins. The disciples, encouraged by the visit of their Lord, seek out Thomas after that appearance, and they tell him, we have seen the Lord, and he cannot and will not believe it. Instead, he says, unless I can put my fingers into the print of his side, unless I can put my hand where the spear was, I will not believe. I cannot believe. It's too much to believe. And so it is for us today. There are a lot of people who say the story is just too much to believe. And yet there Jesus is. And so a week later, on the eighth day again, the day of the resurrection, the disciples are gathered again, not knowing that Jesus is going to appear. And Thomas is with them now. And again, Jesus comes and enters the space where they are, 
And he says to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. I love that. He doesn't merely say, look, Thomas. He addresses Thomas's account, Thomas's statement. Unless I, he addresses that skepticism, unless I put my finger in the imprint in his hand, Jesus says, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Notice this. Jesus doesn't rebuke or shame Thomas for his unbelief. And he doesn't diminish his reason or magically change his mind. Jesus doesn't stand over Thomas and go, Now, Thomas, you are a believer. He doesn't do that at all. And people think that that's how it works, that Jesus is going to come and magically appear to you and wave his hand over your head and you're going to one day believe. No. There's a part of inquiry here where you have to seek and find and place your hand into the side of our Lord. Instead, Jesus invites Thomas into his wounds. He doesn't diminish his, his reason. He invites him into his wounds, for only there will Thomas find him. Thomas much, must touch the wound, and we, we must touch the wound of Christ. It is in the wound, in the breaking open of God, so to speak, that he is found. And it is in our wound that we find his wound. Doubters are safe as long as they don't venture to touch the wound, theirs or his. As long as we stay outside the doors and not venture in to touch the wound, the place where God will prove himself, we're safe. But the moment we place our finger in the wound, in the opening of God, there we will find God. God has got to open our eyes to understand this. This is spiritually understood. Only in honest vulnerability before God will we ever, ever encounter him. As long as we hide from our own wound and his, we will never verify him. As long as we pretend, we will never find the wound. He is verified in his wounds. And he addresses Thomas as he addresses you and each one of us, knowing specifically what our reservations, doubts, and fears are. We are living in a time of great fear. It's easy to wake up in the middle of the night and have a panic attack. Am I breathing OK? It's easy to go out and wonder, are more people going to get sick? Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? What's going to happen after all this is over? What about my job? What about my future? What about my career? What about my children? What about my parents? Fear is always at the door. Fear is always a threat. Jesus comes to stand in the midst of that fear, and he will because he's raised from the dead. And if we allow him, if we allow him behind the closed doors of our hearts, Jesus will stand there. I watched a testimony of a young girl talking about her life, and she was explaining how she was a complete atheist. And she said, I was really a, a nasty person. I was unkind to people, and I was dishonest, and so on. Beautiful young girl. And she said to herself, that you know, she was miserable and she was uh, struggling with uh, anorexia and just a whole host of problems. And she said, for some reason, and I don't know why, I simply said the name Jesus in my mind. And she said, instantly, it was as if he was there. Instantly, I felt the warmth of his love come over my entire life. This is what it means for Jesus to come and stand inside the doors of our barred hearts. All we need to do 
is say Jesus and the risen Lord will be there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all.
receive, O Holy Trinity, this oblation which we offer unto thee in memory of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ our Lord, and in honor of blessed Mary, of a virgin, of blessed John the Baptist, of the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all thy saints, that it may avail them to their honor and us to our salvation. And may they whose memory we celebrate on earth vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept these our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, addiction, persecution, or any other adversity, I invite you to lift up by name those you bear upon your hearts. Eternal David, but who for ever did bear with man to say as Jeremiah Irons, Lisa and Joanne, some entirely different set, Gary Drake, Mary, Nancy, Ed, Lily, Diamond, Kay, Courtney, Peter, Jeffrey, Nick, David, Joan, Gunner, Miles, D.L., Leona, Michael, George and Barbara, Dorothy, Josiah, Jan, Barbara, Kimberly, Harry, Gavin and Jeannie, Gloria, Jenny, Evelyn, Scott and Kim, Chris, Aaron, Vito, Sandy, Jared, Julie, Marianne, Andy, Gerard, Frankie, Charles, Carol and Phil, Kayla, Annity, Justin and Leslie, Karen, Brenda, Hazel, Cindy, Marie, Carrie, Ali, Zinnia, our Reboot family, especially Buddy and Steve and Dave, Gloria Hall Holland and her family, Rebecca Faith Stevens and her family, especially the parents of Elizabeth, CJ, and Donna. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants, departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service and to give us grace so to follow their good examples that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent ye of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession before Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings, the remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear what comfortable words our Lord Jesus Christ saith to all who truly, truly turn unto him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hear what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying, worthy of all men to be received, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto Thee. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, but chiefly we are bound to praise Thee for the glorious resurrection of Thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For He is the very Paschal Lamb which was offered for us and hath taken away the sins of the world, who by his death hath destroyed death, and by his rising to life again hath restored us to everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, All glory be unto thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that is precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured to us by the same. 
And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain a remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we often present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ, our Lord. By whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee. O Father almighty, world without end. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, God, world without end. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. May this mingling and consecration of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ avail us who partake thereof unto life everlasting. Amen. <laughs>
we do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lord, I am not worthy. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him that takest away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. you to come up and receive. We are receiving in one kind only in the host, the body of Christ broken for thee. The body of Christ broken for thee. The body of Christ broken for thee.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> we beseech thee, O Lord, our God, that the holy mysteries which thou hast provided for our salvation may be for our healing, both now and in the time to come through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost vouchsafe to feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of his most precious death and passion. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Let us depart in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son converted the violence of this world in the wounds to his hands and side into a pronouncement of peace, grant that we may ever live in that peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 